So I am pleased, very pleased to be able to welcome Ramendra. And I'll tell you a little bit about him and then a little bit about the group that is sponsoring the workshop and why we're doing it. So Ramendra has written 44 books and about 30 languages they've been translated into. It keeps going up and up. And then I asked him how many stories he's written and you know what he said? He lost count. That means an awful lot of stories. And originally he's from Hyderabad, but later he worked in Odisha for many years. And now he is in Bangalore where he is joining us from. Why are we doing this workshop? Well, I have to tell you a little bit about a group called Education for Life. That's what I'm with. <clears throat> and what it is, it's an educational approach that a number of teachers and schools in America and Europe and now in India are following. And it's a wonderful way of both teaching and learning. It's very, very experiential. It focuses on the child and not so much on the curriculum, although we obviously have to follow a curriculum in a school, but we start with where the child is. And of course, I won't go into very much of that, but it's a very big difference from the way a lot of schools, both here in India and in my own country, which is America. For so many years, it was like, curriculum, do this, 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 and this, do the test, didn't get a good score, you're no good, out, you have no success chances in life, horrible way of teaching and learning, and education for life looks at the child or adults that they're learning and finds a way to use their gifts to work with their consciousness, their energy, and their enthusiasm to find their gifts and let them really find ways to express those gifts. It's very positive, very encouraging, and everybody who comes to our schools just loves the opportunity of learning that way. If you're interested to know more about Education for Life, I will put our websites in the chat, but now, I think it's time that we just very quickly explain why are we having the workshop itself? Well, every year here in India, you have this beautiful day called National Teachers Day. And we've got one in America, but we really don't know much about it. That's true for many countries. I never heard of it before I came here 20 years ago, is it? Almost. And every September the 5th, for some years, Education for Life has sponsored a children's writing contest. And usually it's on qualities of my favorite teacher, or last year it was on a teacher who helped me do more than I thought I ever could. This year, the writing contest is a little different. It's, if you had a magic wand, what are three top qualities that you would like to have in your ideal teacher? So a number of the participants who will be here are some of our contestants, probably some of the parents, <coughs> friends. We've opened it up so it's no longer just for the contestants and our contest, but it's open to everybody who knows about it. And a lot of you I see, I don't recognize, so I'm sure you are friends or fans of Remender. Okay, so now you know who he is, if you didn't, and a little bit about Education for Life, which is sponsoring the contest and why we're doing it. And what we'll do is we will go till 11.30 or a little bit longer since we started a couple minutes late with him doing whatever he's going to do. I know you're going to love it. He's gotten many awards for being a terrific storyteller, not just a writer. And 
workshop leader. And you please, if you've got questions, put them in the chat and I'll be watching the chat. And then at 12.35 or thereabouts, he will take all your questions. We decided to do it this way rather than you raising your hand in between things that he says, because, well, he said it just works better. So we'll go that way. So remember, over to you. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks a ton, EFL and Prisha, for inviting me over. Uh, Prisha did not mention one thing. I thought I'll just clarify that right now I'm a cancer warrior. Uh, I'm uh, kind of being treated for colon cancer uh, stage two. And uh, after four uh, surgeries, four septic shocks, five chemos, five rounds of radiation, 40 days in ICU, 17 kg weight loss. I'm back here uh, to interact with you. And right now my oral chemotherapy is going on, but I think I'm good and fine to go. And it's lovely to see all you beautiful people out there. So to begin with, let me start with the beginning. How did I get to be a writer? When I was around eight years old, I wrote a poem. This must have been the most terrible poem ever written uh, by anybody in humankind. It went something like this. Topsy and Tim went for a swim. Topsy swam well and broke the spell. Tim swam badly and went home sadly. It was such a sad, pathetic poem. But the poet in me was excited about it. And I took, and I scribbled it down and took it to my father. I thought he might say, but what is this you're doing, writing silly poems? You should be studying science like Putul auntie's daughter or Chadda uncle's son. You should be doing math. Instead, you're writing silly poetry. But he didn't do any of these things. He just picked me up, gave me a tight hug and said, one word, wonderful. And if today I'm a writer with 44 books, 30 translations and whatever Prisha introduced me as, it's because of that one word and that tight hug. So I went on to write uh, poems and then I branched into satire. Somebody is saying that the voice of Mr. Ramindra is trailing off. Is there a technical issue? Or is it okay? Is it cool, Tushar? Okay. So I went on to write satire and all, and I got into a bit of trouble, you know, because I wrote a satire which was against the political establishment. Uh, when in uh, around 1995, uh, my uh, daughter was four years old, and my son had just happened. My wife, my beautiful, gorgeous wife, Madhavi, who also worked in the same steel plant as I, had her hands full. So she encouraged me. She inspired me. She motivated me. She said, you are such a useless fellow. You can't sing lullabies. You can't wash bumps. You can't cook. You can't even boil an egg. You think you're a great writer. No. So why don't you tell stories to our daughter, Ankita, while I take care of the newborn baby, Aniket? Now, this was a challenge I had to accept. But being the egoist that I am, I thought, why should I tell tales from the Thinali Raman or Isa? Okay, it seems that Reminder is frozen and our techie here is going to try to check what's happened. Yeah. Good to go? 
Yeah, there was some uh, uh, snafu. I think my wife uh, found out that I'm criticizing her and she tinkered with the internet. Anyways, I'm back again. So uh, after four years, my son Aniket also became a part of my audience. And, uh, but his tastes were different and my uh, daughter's tastes were different. I had to manage both these uh, uh, proclivities and all. And somehow that's how I started uh, getting into, seriously into children's uh, writing. Now, let me switch a bit to the main theme of the workshop. That is how to write fiction for children. Now, this is not a workshop which is, which is going to give you a formula, two spoonfuls of uh, imagination, half a cup of uh, observation, a little bit of creativity, and uh, a tadaka of, uh, what should I say, experience, and you get a great story. No. I'm only going to share a few tips with you, and I hope uh, you'll be able to, you know, enjoy them and go about getting into the art and science of writing. So, what does a story comprise? First and foremost, are the people, or the things, or the animals who inhabit the story. These are called characters. Now, we have three main kinds of characters, types of characters: the major characters, the supporting characters and the minor character. The major character is the person around whom the story revolves. He is the protagonist. He is the hero. Like in Harry Potter, obviously it's Harry. The supporting characters, before that, let me tell you that the major character is so very important and we've had in literature, some characters so beautifully etched out that people forget the writer and only remember the character. For instance, everybody knows of Sherlock Holmes, but I think quite a few people don't know the creator, Arthur Conan Doyle. People know of uh, James Bond, the brother of uh, Groove Bond and the uncle of Ruskin Bond, sorry, James Bond. But not many people know that this character was created by Ian Fleming. So the character, the main character, the protagonist, he is the most important element in any story or novel. Then we have supporting characters who are important, but not as important as the protagonist. In Harry Potter, we have Hermione. I hope I got the pronunciation right, Prisha. Otherwise you'll spank me. Uh, and uh, Ron and Dumbledore and Hagrid. These guys have their own very important roles to play, but not as important, like I said, as the protagonist. Then we have these chutku, mutku, teeny, weeny, chunku, punkus, uh, called minor characters who come in and out of the story and leave a tiny mark. For instance, we have that guy with some kind of a bottom. I think Neville Longbottom in Harry Potter. And we have the uncle and aunt, un uh, Uncle Vernon and uh, Aunt Petunia or something. Yeah. So this, uh, it's very, very important for any writer to make the characters resonate with the reader. Otherwise, the story falls flat. Then we have the second aspect. I'm just touching upon these aspects and I'm not going to any great detail because of time and other constraints. Uh, the second is the plot. And the plot is basically the storyline. We have a beginning, we have a middle, we have an end. In the beginning, the, the, the storyline is introduced. Uh, you have a kind of a problem or a conflict or an issue. In the middle, the characters deal with this problem or try to solve this problem. And in the end, they end up usually in my kind of stories where I always, almost always believe in a kind of a happy ending, they end up solving the problem, hopefully. So we have a beginning, a middle and an end. This has to have a seamless flow, right? The beginning should flow into the middle, which should flow into the end. And the reader, especially the young reader, should, shouldn't have too many questions in his mind as to what happened, who did what to whom and all that. That is how I like my stories to be rather simple. Not too many areas of gray, but many writers don't believe that. They believe that it has to be complex and complicated and people should think, excise their gray matter. I'm not in that business at all. I believe in simplicity. Now, let us move on to dialogues. Now, this... Uh, dialogues are, I think, one of the most important part in a, in a story, especially a children's story. 
for instance they give you the uh, they tell you what makes a character unique the speciality of the character it can be an introvert it can be an extrovert for instance my wife beautiful wife like i mentioned earlier madhvi she is an out and out extrovert she can talk to anything she can have a animated conversation with a door knob for at least 10 15 minutes so one day i just was entering my living room and i found her talking to somebody and she went on talking for almost 33 minutes and i was feeling jealous if you have a beautiful wife and she's talking to somebody for 33 minutes naturally you'll be jealous so then i asked her madhvi who was it who were you talking to she said wrong number but seriously there are some people who love the art and science of conversation and others are not so the way they speak how much they speak and the you know the kind of vocabulary they use tells you about the person dialogues also create suspense ramendra kumar walked into the room and said oh my god what's happening prisha ma'am has got a stick in her hand is she going to beat me suspense what is prisha ma'am going to do is she going to beat me or is she just measuring something or she's waving a magic wand whatever that is suspense then to uh, uh, you know state or show the emo uh, the emotional uh, state of the character for instance whole of last evening i was wondering uh, uh, i was telling my wife madhvi what is going to happen to me is my workshop going to be a success or is pisha ma'am going to you know castigate me for making it a big flop so suspense apprehension anxiety that's all in the way i speak the words i'm using then it can also be oh no i don't remember anything at all i'm getting confused between the plot and the character and the minor and the major what will uh, the efl lovely institution think of me what will prisha ma'am think of me i'm sad or i come and say oh man i'm super confident it's going to be a blast confident and super thrilled to be here amongst all all you lovely people that is another state so dialogues can tell you about these various states then there is something called a setting the milieu where the story is set now let me tell you a, a incident we had gone to meet uh, ruskin bond who is not the brother of james bond or the uncle of brook bond ruskin bond the one of the greatest writers of our times so after we met him uh, in landur we started walking back to the guest house now it was around 9 o'clock in the uh, in the evening it had just rained it was pitch dark on one side there was a cliff on the other side the valley and the there the trees were laden with rain drops and as the wind caressed them the drops we falling there was nobody around there was the only sound was the sound of our footsteps tuck 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 i was and my wife madhvi and i were walking in complete silence at that moment madhvi turned towards me and i and smiled and i thought what would happen to me if she turned into a ghost fortunately she didn't but using this milieu using this setting i wrote a horror story much later called the stranger which was published and appreciated so that sometimes the setting becomes one of the major characters in a story or a novel that is the importance of setting and now we move to language now what should the language be first and foremost uh, of importance is that the language should suit the character now suppose there is a 75 year old professor of physics who is coming to efl naturally he usually will not say things like yo man efl rocks man and uh, pune is a happening place normally he wouldn't say such a thing it would look odd suppose i ask a 7 year old kid how do you feel will he say something like this while promulgating your esoteric cogitations and articulating superficial sentimental and psychological observations beware of platitudinous pondorosity he won't be speaking like that it would be weird if he spoke like that so that's why the character should speak in a language 
which is in sync with his age his background and his sensibilities similarly the language should also be in tune with the uh, the profile of the audience so these are a couple of things which i thought i'll uh, share with you now moving on to the next aspect which is what makes a how do you write a story what are the inputs you need so you need imagination you need observation and you need experience that's what i feel now children have great imagination and great powers of observation though adults think that they are not observing so much but i know for sure when my kids were young they observed one hell of a lot they observed each and every you know shiver when my in my body when my wife was angry with me she they observed each and every smile on her face when i praised her beauty so kids are very very observant and the imagination is fantabulous they might not have that much of experience but they can more than make make it up with imagination and observation we adults we might not have that kind of imagination but we have certain kind of experiences so these three facets you know together they combine to give you the input for creativity then second thing this you must have heard n number of times reading reading is important reading is so very important please read as much as you can in every kind of genre you can it enhances your imagination improves your vocabulary uh, you know uh, tells you a lot of use uh, uh, aspects about usage and teaches you many time cherished values like camaraderie like honesty like courage like gumption and on and on then another aspect which i would like to touch is what is creativity how do i start writing a story how do i get ideas creativity is basically about those tiny sparks floating around you anything and everything can inspire an idea a dialogue in a web series a text on whatsapp a post on insta somebody status on facebook a comment on twitter a conversation in a bus or in the classroom a reprimand from a teacher the caress of a parent as you sleep anything and everything can inspire an idea so my friends please be open to all these sparks of creative which are around you and absorb them internalize them imbibe them and whenever you get a chance write and don't wait for inspiration to write there was a friend of mine my dad's friend actually a very senior person a sahitya academy award winner he would go all the way to kashmir dal lake to write poetry to write poems if i tell my wife that i need inspiration and i need to go to dal lake or some other place Uh, where there's all water and beauty and scenery and all she'll just dump me in the washing machine that's the closest i would get to water and lake and all that you know so don't wait right don't wait for the right moment w r i t e or r i g h t just right when you get these ideas now in our times we didn't have these cell phones and stuff like that now you have whenever you get an idea just record it on your phone and then go back to it later and the third aspect is make writing your ikigai your passion you know you be in the world of words be in the world of writing 24 by 7 that is the best way and i think the most uh, i think the writers here i can see shalini varma and others uh, uh, would agree that writing has to become your ikigai your obsessive compulsive disorder your ocd now let me move on to how i wrote one of my most uh, uh, loved stories my uh, family we had gone to goa some years ago kids were pretty young ankita was 11 and aniket was a precocious 7 
uh, Madhvi and I were sitting on the beach watching the sunset. And here, Ankita and Aniket were having a conversation. Aniket said, you know, Papa, he can write on anything. An Ankita said, don't be such a chamcha of Papa. He can't write on everything. He's a good writer, but you know, he has his limitations. So, no, 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 Papa can write. That's the age when kids think that Papa is a hero. And now he's in the age when he thinks Papa is a big zero. But anyways, so they had this, uh, they said, let's bet on this. And as I was trying to look deep into my wife's eyes and the sunset and comparing the two, suddenly uh, my, uh, my daughter Ankita took a pebble and put it right under my nose. Papa, see this pebble? You have to write a story on this pebble. I said, what? How can I write a story and here? With this, all this kind of things happening, lovely sunset and uh, your beautiful mom and you guys and all that. No, no, I can't write. No, no, Papa, it's a challenge. Aniket said, you have to write because I have put a bet, placed a bet with Ankita. You have to write, Papa. Otherwise, you know what will happen to me? She'll keep teasing me. Did I have a choice? No. When your kids ask you to do something, you damn well do it. So when, the, uh, when my family was busy enjoying in the hotel room. I was sitting on the beach writing a story. Fortunately, I managed to meet the deadline and the story I wrote uh, went on to win an award. And that is the story which I shall be narrating to you. It's called A Pebble on the Beach. This is a story about a man called Satya. He was very honest. He was, he loved people. He loved to spread the message of God, peace, love, harmony. There was one person hanging somewhere who hated him because he was the antithesis of the values which God stood for. He was the devil. He hated God and everything which God stood for. And he hated this guy called Satya. He thought, okay, let me teach this Satya a lesson. So when Satya died and his soul went up, devil was waiting for it and he grabbed it and he told the soul of Satya, ha, 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 ha. you have always been following God, no. And truth and honesty and camaraderie and trust and empathy. Now I'm going to teach you such a lesson that you'll forget everything which God taught you and you'll become my follower. Satya said, that will never ever happen. He said, Acha. Devil said, I'll throw you, I'll turn you into a pebble and throw you on the beach. People will kick you, they'll stamp on you, they'll spit on you. Then you forget God and you'll come to me. Satya said, no way. Then the devil muttered a mantra. Guys, I'll teach you that mantra later, you know. And it's a miraculous mantra. And with that mantra, you can achieve whatever you want, conditions apply. So the mantra was, Amak unja manja, Amak unja wo, chik chik jola, chikak jola, iya, iya, oh. And Satya turned into a pebble and fell on the beach. Now the scene shifts. There was this 12-year-old guy called Debu. He was selling groundnuts in a basket. As he was walking along the beach, suddenly he heard a shout, Hey, hey you, come here. Three guys, three youngsters in their 20s were sitting under a palm tree and drinking. And you know what they would be drinking. Come here, come here. So yeah, give us some groundnuts. So this guy measured three cupfuls and all and gave them, give to the guy who had shouted. He popped the groundnut in his mouth. Ah, quite tasty, quite tasty. So then he looked at uh, Debu and he said, why are you standing? Get lost. Debu said, what about the payment? He said, what payment? He said, these groundnuts cost 10 rupees. I want my 10 rupees. That guy stood up and he said, you dare to ask Joe Mathai? the son of the police commissioner, Samuel Mathai, for money. So then Devi was a tough guy. He said, sir, I cannot go from here without taking the payment. You have to pay me. So Joe looked at his friends and he said, this guy wants payment. 
So, okay, I'll give him payment. And he slapped him hard. Poor Debu fell on one side and the ground nurse on the other and they spilled all over the place. Debu got, and the three of them started laughing. Uh, Joe Mathai and his two friends. Debu picked up the bag, uh, the basket and went crying to one corner of a beach where there was a cluster of palm trees and some bushes. And he sat down. He was seething with anger and frustration. Just then he noticed a gray car just near the bushes, partly hidden. One of Joe's friends opened the boot of the car and picked up, picked up some bottles and went back. Debu had an idea. He thought, let me pick up a pebble or a stone and throw it and smash the windshield and run away. That will teach the great Joe Mathai a lesson which he'll never forget. He looked around and he saw a pebble and he picked it up. He held it in his hand. It was so smooth and shiny and cool to his touch. Like the hand of his mom as she would place it on his forehead as he slept. The anger, the frustration all ebbed away. Just then, Debu saw a man tinkering with the lock of the car. He thought for a moment that he would, I mean, that guy would be a thief possibly. Let him do what is his business. But then Debu gave it another thought and he ran towards Joe, shouting, Joe, sir, Joe, sir. Joe looked up. What is this? You want another round of payment? No, sir. There is, there is, I think, a thief trying to break the lock. Joe got up and his two, and along with his two friends, rushed and they created the, such a racket that the would be wannabe thief ran away. Joe opened the car and looked around and he said, Hey, man, this is good. This is good. There was a stereo which I had bought, which cost 55,000. That is still intact. If my dad would come to know, he would have, you know, skinned me alive. And then he turned towards Debu. He said, thanks, bro. After what I did to you, had I been in your place, I would have just watched the fun. But you came and informed me. You're a real cool guy. Yeah. And he offered him a 500 rupee note. Debu said, no, sir. You have to pay me only 260 rupees. He said, why 260? Debu answered, 250 for the groundnuts which you spilled and 10 rupees for the ones which you ate. Joe was impressed. Hey, man, you really are honest. Okay, he paid him the money and he said, where do you live? So Debu said, uh, I live in Nai Basti. He said, okay, I'm going that way, I'll drop you. So he dropped uh, Debu and Joe after around 15, 20 minutes of driving, got into his garage and he was about to get out of the car when he saw something lying on the seat. He picked it up. Hey, this is cool. The kid must have dropped it. It was, so, it was very shiny, shiny. It was very cool to his touch. And he had a sensation which he had never experienced before. A sensation of peace, of calmness. Hey, I think I'm going to keep it with me. And he put it in his pocket and he went to his house. He opened the lock, hoping, he, uh, hoping that his father would have slept. It was past 12. But just then, the lights came on and Joe found himself staring into the eyes of Richard Samuel Mathai, his father, tall and hefty, with a thick mustache, and a very impressive personality. Is this the time for a young man to come home and that to punch drunk? Richard Samuel Mathai shouted. Joe thought his father was, would, always thought his father was a pompous old man and he didn't care for him, you know. Young, brass Joe. He didn't bother about his father. And normally he would have shouted back and both of them would have got into an argument and Joe's mom would have come in between and cried her house out. But today, Joe felt different. He told his dad, Dad, I'm sorry. I've decided to stop drinking. Samuel Mathai was surprised. 
what what did you say son yes dad and then joe narrated the incident with debu and he went on to say a person a kid living in the slums experiences such cruelty such trauma and such difficult times he has to face if he can uphold such values i come from a so called cultured family should i not be should i not rise above the level of savagery or of this kind of behavior which i used to indulge in you know drinking and fighting and indulging in hooliganism and all joe's dad samuel was him was deeply moved he pulled him close and gave him a hug even as as his eyes started flowing with tears i i love you my son samuel mathai said joe hugged him back and with his eyes moist replied i too love you dad now the devil sitting somewhere between heaven and hell was watching the scene and he said oh my god what a mistake what a blunder i have made this fellow will you know he's turning everybody into goody goody people i'll pick him up call him back and throw him into hell you know i can't throw him back to hell because in hell if everybody becomes good then i'll become jobless i'll get him back and send him to his master god so again he did that ama kunja munja ama kunja wo chik chik jola chika ko jola e a e a o and got the pebble back and he looked at it he suddenly felt it very smooth to his touch very cool shiny there was some kind of change in devil in the devil he started feeling a sense of peace and harmony which he never ever felt before he thought why should i pick up fights with god he has never done any harm to me rather i think he's tried to help me also no this pebble i'm going to keep with me and i'm going to become friends with god and he started moving towards god to be, to forge a friendship forever and ever thank you the stage is yours prisha ma'am you are on mute okay so gosh you have ended a little earlier than i thought well my goodness what a story i think you all had i think you had us all on what we call pins and needles like what's mm -hmm. happen next quite a plot what i would love to have everybody do if you don't mind if if you would like to get some visuals that would be little graphics that show everything that ramendra was trying to talk about in the workshop like you need people and plot and dialogues and setting and language and one way that we remember things is what we see so i am going to make a couple of visuals and you can have them also he's got four tips i think he gave us only three but we have visuals already for his tips now how do you get them I will need your email address. So if everybody would type in the chat your email address and your name, your first name and your last name, I will promise that within a couple of days at the latest, you can have those visuals. And maybe a couple of other things. Remember, might want to give us a list of all of his books. He might want to give us another story that we might look at. Oh, uh, anyway, we need your email address to do that. Second, another little gift. I'm sure that you would like to share this visual, oh, what did I say? This workshop with people. And it is recorded. So we will be posting the recording link. I think by tomorrow, Tushar, do you think we can have it up? Yes. So 
at some point on Monday, come back to edforlife.in. I put that address a little earlier in the chat. I'll do it again here. I'm just going to type without all the like WWs or the HTTP, whatever. I'm just going to type this edforlife.in. Oops, that went to just one person. Try that again. So if you go there, that will be the main page, which is for Education for Life in India. Tushar earlier in the workshop also posted, and I'll do, put it up here again, another site would be of interest to you if, only if, you would like to know more about Education for Life in general. The one I put up, edforlife.in, is a site that's under construction. Hopefully we'll have it up a little bit more in good shape within, oh, I guess at least three weeks, we'll probably have everything we want to post. And it will be for people who particularly are interested in education for life here in India. But the other one that ends in ORG will be about education for life in general. I see a couple of email addresses coming, so <clears throat> please keep it up. <coughs> we have some time. Uh, I would like to uh, just narrate uh, the reaction of my kids to my stories. Oh, please. Yeah. So what would happen is that my daughter loved those kind of stories, you know. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there lived a beautiful princess. She fell in love with a tall, dark, handsome prince. Just then a monster, a Rakshasa entered and the prince using his ingenuity and skill captured the Rakshasa, put him in a dungeon and they lived happily. The prince and the princess lived happily ever after. And my son Aniket, his taste was exactly the opposite. He was a great fan of Bruce Lee, Superman, Spider-Man, and God knows how many men, except Padman, because Padman had not existed then. So his taste was full of violence and gore. He would love that in the second or third sentence, the hero would be pulling the lip of the villain, lips of the villain. And by the time the story ended, the villain's kidney would be flying in the stratosphere, and the hero would be, you know, literally pulling apart the entrails of the villain and his cronies. So full of violence and gore. So for me to balance once upon a time, long, long ago, and dishum, dishum, and dishum was one hell of a task. Fortunately, with the blessings of my dad, I could do this. And that's why I'm a writer. And my son and daughter both loved, uh, what they loved the most was horror stories. And I'm sure the kids here also would love horror, uh, scary stories. So I would start narrating a horror story. And my son, he was around four and a half or something. He would uh, be sitting a couple of feet away. And I would start like this. At the stroke of midnight, Lakshmi stepped out of her house. Chum, 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 chum. The sound of the anklets echoed in the stillness of the night. And as she took one step after the other, Aniket started moving towards me inch by inch. And then I would say, Lakshmi saw a huge mansion. It was so ghostly. Cobwebs were hanging from every pillar and window. And as she stepped forward, the door opened. And she stepped in. And then there was a sound of a wolf. And by the time the wolf ate Lakshmi, or Lakshmi killed the wolf, Aniket would be sitting on my lap, 
holding me tight and looking up at me and then believe me those blissful moments i wish i could relive again and again on cold winter evenings summer twilights rainy afternoons my kids and i explored this world of magic wonder fantasy again and again and created memories which to us are even now the most cherished ones so i tell i would like to request the parents and teachers here particularly the parents do spend time with your children if you can't tell them stories of your own read out from books the proximity you would share the voice uh, i mean your voice and his or her reaction these would create memories which would be like diamonds and would last forever i have created a concept called have you heard of atm any time money or automatic teller machine i have created a concept called atm card or any time memory card for creating this card is so very important in the sense it's so very valuable because it's priceless right it has no you can't put a value to it it's priceless right and whatever the vagaries of the stock market the price of this card would keep on increasing it won't get stolen it won't get broken it won't get torn it won't get lost your dolls will get torn the gizmos will get broken and uh, those playstations might get jammed but these memories would last forever and what do you need to create memories you need only two four letter words love and time and you have plenty of both though you claim i don't have the time don't buy gizmos for, you can buy gizmos or whatever i don't mind that but spend time quality time with the children not like you know like like a colleague of mine one day he said he wants to take leave and spend time with his daughter i was thrilled i said oh by all means and he went home later and he told me that i was watching virat kohli scoring a century and i had given a drawing sheet to my da- my daughter and she was scribbling that's not spending quality time quality time is keeping you in the same, both of you in the same space holding her attention giving her your every mood and moment for that particular period i and my kids would have a blast every few months it was called papa's day out we would send my mom with a huge uh, lunch uh, box so that she wouldn't come for lunch we would dress up into crazy kind of clothes and jump around go to the local zoo and chat with the monkeys and play cricket or play some stuff crazy stuff and go to hotels where my wife would dare step into oh you know it's not so very hygienic i can't do that you know we'll get malaria and laveria and what not and all but we would enjoy and we would have a blast then on uh, every may uh, the, our house in rorkela there would be rains and the lawn had a slight kind of uh, you know slope so it would be filled with the muck and i would pick up my son and no you know, know chuck him like this and all that muck would splatter on the wall and madhi would come out and say what is this what are you dirtying up the place and then she would say what would your colleagues think you are see i was senior manager then you are senior manager in rorkela steel plants public relations department 769011 what will your neighbors our neighbors think and i would tell her the colleagues can go to hell the neighbors can take a long walk as long as i and my kids are enjoying and having a blast that is all that is important that is all that is to be cherished and now when i ask my kids what are the best moments of of their life they don't remember the gizmo or the gadget what they remember is papa's day out and fun in the rain thank you <laughs> that is a wonderful story in itself We have a question that has just come in. You know, I have a feeling many people might wonder too. We heard Remender talk about his cancer. He has really faced it very heroically and in a very interesting way with humor. He didn't really talk about all he did with that, but here's the question. I'm going to read it from Brian. Do you think that your exposure to the big C cancer has deepened and enhanced your penchant to write 
As I presume you have now experienced personal pain and anguish of a dimension that normal humans may not have been exposed to. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And yes, it is, I think, uh, changed me forever and ever. I have really, really realized the importance of relationships. And people say that the, uh, many people say that the virtual relationships, online relationships are transient, are ephemeral, are really, are really fake, but I don't agree. The kind of love, affection, adoration, prayers and blessings I got from my online friends and from, of course, my relatives, my offline friends as well, was, was humongous. You know, I got people prayed in churches, in temples, in gurudwaras. They offered chadar in a darga. They prayed in masjid. They sent me mantras, incantations, invocations. A friend of mine observed a fast. And uh, a, a person wrote to me that his dad was confined to a wheelchair and wouldn't get up and walk. Then he saw, saw a dance video of me and my daughter dancing to a 70s, 80s number. And he started beginning to make an attempt to walk. How heartwarming is that, Prisha? Then there was this lady who's uh, fighting cancer, fourth stage. She continuously watches my sessions on YouTube, Zoom, and uh, watches my dance videos. And she said that she's getting strength uh, from watching me to fight the cancer and, you know, kick it on its butt. And there have been People have called me a messiah, a inspiration, a, a motivator, or whatnot. I'm not. A, I'm none of that. I'm simply a normal human being who's been blessed with so much of love, so much of adoration, so much, so much, so many, so many prayers and blessings that they have kind of formed a a, a shield, which has helped me fight this scourge this monster with complete, how should I say, positivity and optimism. There is an ecosystem of positivity in which I feel I exist. And on a lighter note, I don't know whether you know these films and all, there are two philosophers I follow, Brian would agree. One philosopher is Gabbar Singh, who said, jo dar gaya, wo mar gaya. And the second philosopher is 2022 Pushpa, who said, Basically, what I mean is, I have tried to fight this uh, tumor with my own brand of humor. So maybe, Raminder, you could talk a little more about how you have done that with humor. This is very unusual, but I think it's definitely true. I know many people who are into healing and maybe not so much that they give the uh, suggestion about doing humor, but rather that you always look beyond where you are, try to find what good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. See, what happened when I first came to know that I'm, my uh, colon is full, uh, my intestine is full of polyps, my colon is full of polyps, and I had to be decolonized. Uh, so... I, normally decolonization is a great thing, but not in this case when my intestine would be cut up and all. And I raved and ranted. And my, I sat with my family in the uh, in the restaurant of the hospital, and I, you know, just cursed fate. I cursed everything and everybody and all. Why did, should this happen to me? Poor me. And uh, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I have a I'm reasonably lean and slim and trim. I exercise regularly. I don't eat red meat. Red meat. So how could this happen to me? And there was so much of angst in me, you know? so much of anger and frustration. And then I looked at my family and I saw their faces crumple. And I decided I couldn't do this to them. It's not their fault. If I start crumbling now, what's going to happen to them? And for me, family has always come first. And I thought, I have to change the narrative. I've had a very tough life, Prisha. I'm from a broken home. My parents divorced, I think, when I was only 15. I'm a suicide survivor at around 14. I suffer from brittle diabetes and I have an insulin pump attached to me. The only attachment apart from my beautiful wife 
I suffered from hemangioma, which is a strange kind of polyp which grows somewhere near the vocal cords. And I was almost losing my voice. And my wife was ecstatic with joy that what she couldn't achieve in 17 years, a hemangioma could achieve in seven weeks. And that critical surgery was performed. It was a very critical surgery. It was performed in Hyderabad. And fortunately, I got my life and my this thing, voice back. And Madhvi also was quite happy. And then this cancer happened. So I knew as a writer, as a storyteller, as an inspirational speaker, my narrative had to be different. I had to fight this humor with this, sorry, this tumor with my own brand of humor, like I've said. So I went online with the, a take on Amitabh Bachchan's dialogue in Diwar, in Silsila. And we did a couple of dance videos, my daughter and I, uh, choreographed by me, of course. And uh, so every, and I flooded the social media with messages which were full of hope and optimism. I wanted people to realize that cancer is a word. It is not a sentence. And positivity and optimism will not make me live longer. I will not live as long as Queen Elizabeth, bless her soul. But every day of my life, I will live better. There will be more. The quality of my life would improve every day. If I have this attitude of positivity, of optimism, of humor, and reaching out to people with my little message as much as I can, as often as I can, and whichever way I can. I think this is very, very similar to what we hear about a lot of people who are wonderful singers or comedians, sometimes actors, which is they too had a lot of sadness and challenge in their life. I wonder sometimes maybe the very best of our storytellers, whether in song or print or comedy, the very best ones have had to go through pain Somehow, maybe that is how we learn. True. I always believe that the worst of times bring out the best in you. I, I, I personally believe. And let me narrate another, uh, I'll give you another example. I have a brother-in-law, my sister's husband, who laughs once a month when he gets his salary. Otherwise, he's so full of gravity that had, new, had he been in the times of Newton, he would have discovered gravity without the help of the apple. He's always so serious. But I believe in levity, not gravity. So he told me once, what the hell? How do you behave like this? You're so childlike. I mean, you behave like a kid, always jumping around, making fun and all. Nobody will take you seriously. You're a general manager. I was general manager then in a big company and all. You have to maintain that gravitas. You have to be serious, you know. But you're like a kid. So I told him, oh my God, this is the ultimate compliment you've paid me. You've called me a kid and you've called me childlike. I wish I could remain a child for the rest of my life. And I wish every adult would remain a child because that is the best state to be in, pure, innocent, pristine. And as long as we are childlike, we really are alive. But the sad part is we adults. Grow, we, we as children grow into adults and that's where we snuff out everything that is beautiful in our lives. Please shut up after that. Thank you. That's beautiful. We have another question. Who is your favorite author and which is your most favorite book? This is very easy to answer. My favorite author is Pelham Grenville Woodhouse, P.G. Woodhouse. And my favorite book, because I think he's the greatest comic writer on planet Earth. And uh, my favorite book is one written by him called Leave It to Smith, where the P is si uh, silent, P. Smith, Leave It to Smith. I must have read it at least 11 to 12 times. And before my uh, engineering exam, I would read a couple of chapters and then go and appear for the exam. And even now, whenever I'm feeling down and out, I just pick up from anywhere in, uh, in the middle or at the end or the beginning and read a few uh, lines or a few sentences. So P.G. Woodhouse, absolutely top of the line. I think he's one of my favorites too. I just put in the chat how you spell his name. If you haven't met him yet, do, do. He has tremendous books and plays and even some poems. Yeah. 
I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I've got one, which actually I think maybe some people think of when they meet a writer like you who's gotten very famous and has written so much. And that would be, what did you find hardest about writing? Uh, so I don't find anything hard about writing because if you're passionate about something, if you love something, how do you find it uh, hard? So because I'm a blockhead, but I don't suffer from a writer's block. For the simple reason that I've written in all genres, I've written picture books to young adult, to adult books, uh, books for grown-ups. I've uh, written books, uh, realistic stories, fables, folk tales, fantasies, satires, poems. So whenever I get bored in one particular genre, I switch to another genre and continue. So I enjoy writing. So there's nothing difficult about writing. But yes, publishing has its own travails. It has its own roadblocks road and all. So that's a part and parcel of every writer's life. So, I mean, I just take it with a pinch of salt. I would like to add one more thing. Talking about my uh, uh, brother-in-law, when uh, I was, I had gone online with all these uh, uh, takes on Amitabh Bachchan and this fun stories and all that, he sent a WhatsApp message to my, uh, to my wife. And he said, what is this guy doing? Doesn't he realize that he's playing with death? Cancer is a scourge. It's going to kill him in bits and pieces. He should just be serious. He can't laugh at death. So I told my wife that you please tell him that I will not allow any cancer, any damn scourge, any damn curse, any damn anathema to put a semicolon or a colon to my humor and my creativity. You're quite a punster. You, I can see that you really love word play. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Because perhaps the time has come to say goodbye, but I want to, if I don't see any more questions, I, I want to just say one other thing, which is when we first asked Remender to do the workshop, we didn't know that he was going to do it primarily on fiction, even though he is a fiction writer. The contest that I mentioned, the writing contest that EFL, that's short for Education for Life, that we sponsor every year around National Teachers Day is not fiction, but rather it's an essay and that's called nonfiction. So he writes fiction and our focus for the contest anyway has been nonfiction. So we were thinking, okay, how do we put this together? Because we really wanted him. He's become a very good friend of Education for Life. And I could see after a while, here is how we do it. And I'll leave you with this. And that is everything really is a story. When you think about what is an advertisement, what is an essay, even though it's like, here's what I think, or, any other kind of writing that is not a story. It is a story. It is about people. That was how Remender started off when you talked about what does writing entail. It has to be about people. People have to see what's in it for me to read this or to buy this product. And what is the plot? Well, you may not think of an ad or an essay is having a plot, but it does. It's just not maybe the same as the plot that you write for a story. That is the kind of story he writes. And then he mentioned dialogues and setting and language. Well, goodness, all of that's very important. What words do we use? How do we say them? What context or setting do we put them in? So I just want to leave you with that because writing is all of a piece. It is not only fiction and it's not only nonfiction. And it's very exciting. And some people get into one of that or some people get into one more than the other. Like Remender is an outstanding non... I'm catching myself. <laughs> Delete. He is a fiction writer. 
but many others are nonfiction specialists. And yet, isn't it beautiful that we really do the same thing? And I hope everybody gets inspired. He called this word ikigai. Frankly, I never heard of it before you mentioned it, Remender. I had to look it up. But it's your passion. What makes you really feel this is me. It is what makes you get out of the bed Absolutely. every morning. Absolutely. It's like what sports people find when they call it being in the zone. So basketball players, tennis players, swimmers, you know, any sports people, when they're really into what they're doing, they are calling it. Yes, she's got the book. She's got the book. Great. Great, Ananya. Oh, uh, I have that book. Okay, maybe you sent it to me. He just sent me a pile of books that I'm having to wait. No, Ananya, Ananya has got the book, The Little Child there. She's showing it. Oh. Yeah, this is a lovely book, which talks in essence about the concept, the philosophy, the credo of Ikigai. Good one, Ananya. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's good. Prisha, Prisha, if I could intervene. Prisha. Bellini. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks, Ramendraji, for uh, inviting me for this. I thoroughly enjoyed. Prisha, I can send you the e-copy of it. If you want, I have it ready with me. I will send across right away after the session. Thank you. Please do. And again, let me remind everybody, we would love to have your own e-addresses so we can send you some good things too. So I guess this can is... We, can we end with a mantra? Why not? Uh, can we can everybody come on screen because you have to follow this mantra along with me. Yeah. <laughs> and this mantra Shalini knows uh, will help you achieve whatever yeah. you want, yes. except some conditions apply, which I'll tell yeah. you later. So hi Brian. So please uh, everybody come on screen and follow follow me. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. We yeah. need to be unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, Ramendra. No, no, no. We have to create a racket. Okay. My wife should think the house is on fire. <laughs> so repeat after me. Hold your hands like this. I hope you can see. Amak unja munja. Everybody Amak unmute. Unja. Everybody unmute. Amak unja munja. Amak unja munja. Brian, I can't see. I can't hear you. Sorry. Amak unja munja. Amak unja munja. Amak unja wo. Amakunja wo. Chik jola. Chik chik jola. Chikak jola. Chikak jola. Iya iya wo. Iya iya wo. Like my brother-in-law would say. Amakunja munja. Repeat. Amakunja wo. Amakunja wo. Chik jola. Chik chik jola. Sad person. Chikak jola. Chikak jola. Iya iya wo. Iya iya wo. The last time. Like I would say, with or without cancer. Ama kunja munja. Ama kunja munja. Ama kunja wo. Ama kunja wo. Chik chik chola. Chik chik chola. Chik chik chola. Chik chik chola. Ya ya ho. Ya ya ho. Ya ya ho. Ya ya. So this mantra, get up at six thirty in the morning, any day of the week. The room should be kind of. Silent, the light should not be too bright. Recite this mantra. Whatever you want to achieve, you'll be achieved. The only thing is the date should be 30th February. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so any more? goodies to share, remember, any more mantras, any more words of wisdom, or do we say goodbye? I think we can say goodbye. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and a joy to have you with us, and that goes also for all the people who will be watching. We know there are plenty of people who can't come, couldn't come this morning, but they will be watching. So, have a wonderful Sunday. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Pisha. Thanks, Tushar. Thanks, each and every one of you for making this uh, my first session after the cancer surgery such a blast. Now you can go dance.
of course 